This video is a short introduction to recording observation codes on EICRs correctly. What code to use is very much up to the individual inspector who is on the spot, so to speak, and many inspectors will need little assistance to coding correctly. But what if you're just beginning your journey into the world of inspection and test? This video will help. Recently, we've had a few requests to make a simple introduction into choosing the correct observation codes. Is there an easy way to distinguish between a C1 and a C2? And when should a C3 be used? So this video will keep things simple. There will be a couple of tips on how to look at the different codes, and these will help you to understand the logic behind the codes. One question that often pops up goes like this. If the installation was installed to a previous edition of the wiring regulations and possibly showing evidence of additions, which version of the wiring regulations should we use? We, that's you and I, and any inspector, should always inspect and test to the most current version of the IET wiring regulations and Guidance Note 3. We can then make considered judgments as we find items that do not conform to current standards. The current wiring regulations are BS 7671 2018 Amendment 2 2022. We should start with the model forms for an EICR. Electrical schemes like NIC, EIC and NAPIT produce their own forms at a cost to you. They are based on the model forms issued by the IET and these model forms are available to you as a free PDF download from the IET website. Model forms, once downloaded, can be used free of charge for your own work and business needs. All the forms are included in the PDF, the EIC forms, minor works and EICR and so on. And I just print off the pages that I need. The condition report inspection schedule pages will actually walk you through a periodic inspection. Each box on the schedule tells you what you should be inspecting and gives you the regulation numbers that apply. You can find further information and clarification in the wiring regulations book. Each inspection step is listed and I would strongly suggest that you use the inspection schedule as a checklist so that nothing is missed. Many inspectors will use a rough copy to mark up on site and then transfer the data to a clean copy or an online form back at the office. All the information, all the prompting and help that you need is there. Use it. What are the observation codes? What does each one mean and how do we use them? There are four observation codes of interest to us in this video. C1, C2 and FI form a group together with C3 standing on its own. When inspecting, your observations, if any, will point you to one of these four. Any C1, C2 or FI will automatically make the EICR unsatisfactory. A fail, if you like. Given the conditions that you observed, the installation is not in a satisfactory condition for continued use. This does not mean that the installation cannot be used by the client, it means that the client must take steps to rectify the issues noted within a reasonably short time. If it's a business, the client will usually be expected by the insurance company to put a plan in place to bring the installation up to the required standard and to then prove that the work has been done. This is achieved by remedial work being carried out and each item being recorded as completed and satisfactory on either an EIC or minor works certificates for each item. When all the work is completed and certified, the installation will automatically become satisfactory. There is no need for you to carry out another inspection. Your obligations were complete when you issued the original EICR and your invoice. Having said that, it often happens that you are asked to complete the remedial work. The C3 code is used where your observations show minor deviations from the current regulations or items that, although not dangerous, 
would benefit from some attention. C3s only on an EICR will leave the report as a satisfactory. What do the codes mean? C1 is dangerous right now. Immediate action is required to remove the danger to life or property. It cannot wait. C2 is classed as potentially dangerous. Urgent action is required to prevent a potentially dangerous situation from becoming dangerous. FI means that further investigation is needed. This item might be potentially dangerous, but this could not be determined during the inspection and more investigation is required. And C3 is for improvement recommended. It's not dangerous as it is, but the item and overall safety of the persons and buildings would benefit from improvement. Taking a closer look at the C1 observation code, what have we got? As we said, C1 is dangerous right now. We must take action. The inspector must impress upon the client that this situation is immediately dangerous, that this situation cannot be ignored and action to remove or limit the C1 danger cannot be delayed. There is a danger present right now of persons or livestock receiving an electric shock or there is a risk of fire. Some examples of C1 codes. An exposed live conductor protruding from an accessory or some equipment. This is immediately dangerous because only one thing needs to happen in order to receive an electric shock. Just reach out and touch the wire. Bang! Electric shock. I think of C1 as just one action. Touch it. And I find that this helps me to visualise the code better. C1 for one action. And here are some other examples of C1 codes. And there will be many more that you will come across. One of the common ones for me was cables passing through knockouts into accessories without glands. The hole was often still large enough to put a finger through and touch live parts inside. The same with missing blanks in consumer units. Part of our job as electricians is to blank off any gaps between circuit breakers. It's not an option, it's a requirement. Damaged cables will be another common sight, leaving exposed copper conductors and so too will be damaged sockets and light switches where part of the face is missing allowing direct access to live parts. And another good one, connector blocks are used to join live conductors together and then left behind or on top of cupboards without being placed into a suitable protective enclosure. Think of the client spring cleaning on top of the cupboards. They see the connector block and before they know what they're doing they've picked it up and bang, electric shock. Clatter clatter as they fall off the step ladders and then it's an ambulance jobby to the hospital to fix the broken leg. And this happens. Only one action is necessary to receive a shock. Just pick the block up. Moving on to C2 observation codes now. C2 codes are used for something that has the potential to be dangerous. It's important that an item designated as C2 is corrected as a matter of urgency. Again, the situation cannot be ignored and prompt action should be taken to resolve the issues. Although danger is not present at this very moment, it will only require a slight change in circumstances for danger to be present and for persons to be at risk. For example, the outer sheathing of a twin and earth cable is damaged and the inner insulation is exposed. Two things need to happen. The remaining insulation becomes damaged and exposes the live copper conductors and then you touch them. Think C2. Two things happen to get an electric shock. C2, 2. Other examples, and again, there will be many more that you will come across in your work. A light switch with a metallic faceplate is installed on a metal back box with no earth fly lead to the back box. This often happens where the light switch has originally been in plastic and this has then been changed to a fancy metallic one without regard to the earthing. Again, two things have to happen. The copper of a line conductor touches the metal back box, that's one thing, and the earth fly lead 
he's not there to make the fuse blow. That's two things. And as soon as you try to turn the light off, you get an electric shock. Have a look down this short list, which is by no means exhaustive, and consider what you've already seen on different sites. Socket outlets supplying outdoor equipment do not have 30 milliamp RCD protection, for example. The mower cable is cut through, and the cut cable remains energised because there's no RCD to isolate the supply. And then someone picks up the still live cable. That's two things. And this scenario actually killed a husband and wife just a few years ago. Husband had the mower plugged into the kitchen sockets, no RCD. The grass was still wet from a rain shower a few hours earlier. He cut through the mower cables, bent down to pick them up and received a fatal electric shock. His wife saw him fall down with the cable still in his hands. She grabbed the cut mower cable, which hadn't blown the fuse, and she also had a fatal electric shock. A true story. Moving on to FI now, further investigation needed. This coding means that the item has the potential to be dangerous, but we don't know yet what it is, as this could not be determined at the time of the inspection. More information or investigation is required, perhaps consulting manufacturers' installation instructions and so on. Further investigation into the potential defect should be carried out as a matter of urgency and not delayed. This will help for the correct code to be allocated to it. For instance, a high resistance is measured in a final circuit CPC and needs to be investigated for possible breaks, damage or loose connections. The inspection process expects you to identify and classify areas where there are problems, not necessarily to locate the exact problem. This is the purpose of after inspection remedial work. You identify that the circuit has a fault, classify the fault and then you move on. The remedial work will find the fault. Some other FI issues are shown here. Similar to the last slide, you identify that a circuit has low insulation resistance readings, but there is not the time nor expectation for you to spend an hour or more tracing the problem. This is further investigation and remedial work. It might be you that does it, but this is a separate contract to the actual inspection. And C3 observation codes are next. This is improvement recommended. An item or situation has been found that is not a C1, a C2 or an FI, but the inspector feels that it should be brought to the client's attention. It's something that should be considered to improve the installation's overall safety and conformance. Think about this. 1970s installation methods and materials were considered state-of-the-art 50 years ago. They were the latest must-have accessories at the time, with the best installation methods being used. Now they are old-fashioned, but that does not make them wrong. An installation that was correctly installed to a previous edition of the wiring regs and still conforms to those same regulations cannot be automatically deemed as unsafe. In Chapter 65 of the Regulations book, on page 239, you will find this note, and I quote from the book. Existing installations may have been designed and installed to conform to previous editions of BS 7671 applicable at the time of their design and erection. This does not necessarily mean that they are unsafe. End of quote. A very common question is, what about plastic consumer units? The regulations now state the consumer units should be constructed from non-combustible materials, which means metal to most of us. If the property has a plastic consumer unit that was installed to a previous edition of the regs when plastic was okay to use, and it is still working as intended, then there is no requirement to change it to a metal one. We will record a C3 and suggest to the customer the metal consumer units offer better fire safety and leave it at that. 
If the client says no, then that is fine. Your obligation is to tell them, and that is now complete. And here are just a few more C3 examples. You will come across installs where the main bonding conductors are not continuous, where the pipes are next to each other and just one earthing conductor is used for the gas and water. The bonding conductor terminates at the gas pipe and then a second conductor links to the water pipe. The problem is that the gas bonding could be removed and this will leave the water pipe without any main bonding. And another common one, outdoor lights connected with basic twin and earth cable with no UV stabilisation. After a few hot summers, the outer sheathing will start to go hard and may crack or split if the cable is moved. Think of C3s as being like advisories on an MOT for a car. That brings us to limitations. Not an observation code, but important to know. Limitations are used to indicate that a particular item or circuit has not been inspected or tested for certain justifiable reasons. This is important. A satisfactory report that contains limitations is only satisfactory for the parts of the installation that have been inspected and tested. The recording of limitations should not be used just as a lazy reason to avoid inspecting or testing items or circuits, as this leaves this part of the installation in an unknown state as regards electrical safety. All circuits should be tested where possible. A satisfactory report does not apply to the limitations as they remain uninspected or untested. You will agree limitations with the clients before the inspection and test, but you should avoid putting too many limitations on the EICR. You are there, after all, to attempt to inspect and test all of the electrical installation. If the periodic inspection is for commercial and industrial insurance purposes, then the insurance company will expect to see all the installation inspected. And be honest with yourself. Is an EICR with lots of limitations applied to it really worth the paper that is written on? Limitations should be limited. There are justifiable reasons. Heavy furniture or machinery may block access to a fused spur. Or the house or a room may be occupied by a hoarder with so many hoarded objects that they completely block access to parts of the installation. And high bay lighting in factories, perhaps 15 or 20 metres above your head. If high pass access is not possible, no scaffold tower, no cherry picker, and the client does not want to provide or pay for these, then inspection of these parts cannot be done. And just a quick reminder of the different observation codes and limitation code. If you understand these, if you can keep these in your head whilst working, you will surely allocate the correct codes to your observations. I hope you found this video useful and informative. Inspection and testing is a skill that improves the more that you do it. It's important that you don't rush the job. Accuracy matters. You are, after all, signing off a professional and legal document that people are going to rely on for their safety. Enjoy, have fun and keep adding to your mental toolbox. Thank you for watching, it really is appreciated. Please subscribe to our channel to get access to all of our videos and remember to click on notify to be sure of not missing our next video. And you will find even more information, videos and help on our website at learnelectrics.com. And don't forget, you can also type in Learn Electrics, all one word, into the YouTube search bar to go directly to our channel at any time from any computer. We are always adding new videos to our channel, so don't miss the next one. And once again, thank you for watching, and we hope to see you again very soon.